Good evening and welcome to the second of our faculty exhibition lectures of the semester. I am welcoming you on behalf of Interim Dean Amy Dynas, who is downtown at an AIA Michigan leadership meeting and could not be here, unfortunately, with us this evening. But she asked with me to share with you uh, some comments and a welcome for Professor Aaron Jones. So here I go with her words. Professor Jones is unbelievably dedicated to the academy, which is evident in his teaching and service. The evidence of his success as a professor is acknowledged through a variety of noted exhibitions, awards, and professional growth within the students he has taught and mentored. Additionally, I, Amy, would be remiss if I didn't mention Aaron's role in the development and design of the Desi Detroit Center for Design and Technology. Aaron designed many custom furniture pieces within the center and offered his services as project architect during a critical moment within the development of the center. Lastly, Aaron has acted as a mentor to me and a strong advocate regarding my leadership and vision for this college. I'm honored to have Aaron as a colleague friend and contributor to Lawrence Tech and the design community both regionally and nationally. Thank you, Erin, Amy Interim Dean of COAD. And now to introduce Aaron himself, I'll ask Charlie O'Jean to come to the mic. Thank you, Dean Dynas. I mean, Deirdre. Um, so, welcome to this evening's talk. I'm Charlie O'Jean. I'm a college professor of architecture here at Lawrence Tech. Um, and I'm standing here representing the exhibitions committee. Um, hopefully you all got a chance to look at the work in the brick gallery. Sorry that the pizza ran out, so you may not have gotten a chance to look at the work, but you should. Um, uh, it's on the other side of the courtyard, and Aaron's got uh, images and objects from past and current work. Uh, uh, just to speak about the exhibitions uh, committee for a second, we have several different exhibition spaces within the college, um, but they all have slightly different focuses. The Brick Gallery is host to alumni and faculty work that creates uh, a link between the academy and practice, uh, largely alternative practices, where we host uh, work whose focus uh, and creativity go beyond the classroom. Uh, it's also the link between disciplines and the college, uh, so I think Aaron's work uh, is very appropriate for that space. Um, so this lecture is meant to be a quasi-gallery talk where Aaron presents his work and then lets us into the process of its making. Um, and it's the process part that I'd like to meditate on for a, a second while you watch the fingers run across towards the disappearing houses. Um, so unless Rebecca's here, which I don't think she is, uh, it's serendipitous, no? Uh, it's serendipitous for me to be selected to introduce Aaron uh, because I probably know, I've probably known him longer than anyone else in this room. Uh, Aaron and I were colleagues at Cranbrook uh, Academy up the road, um, and you can't tell from the work in the gallery today, but when Aaron arrived at Cranbrook, he had uh, little to no building experience. Uh, well, I guess that's not true. Aaron was a skater as a kid and built ramps, you know. But uh, besides that part, he was very much unfamiliar with the building process. Uh, but what blew me away when I first met him and, and still continues to blow me and everyone else away uh, are his drawings. Um, uh, Aaron making a drawing is like a 70-year-old mason stacking bricks. Uh, the mason knows the tools, the material, and the processes so well uh, that they don't have to double-check things, uh, they don't have to measure spacing, and they don't have to look at their watch to know when to strike the joints. They can, they can smell it in the air, um, just like Aaron smelling uh, uh, SketchUp to create that. Um, so it's this extremely high understanding of the medium that Aaron has for drawing. He knows how to make crazy, wacky, humorous, yet rigorous and clear drawings by combining uh, simple conventions with normal tools. Uh, it's kind of like uh, Professor Kamath's lecture a few weeks ago, I don't know if Ayo's here, uh, where he admitted in the end with a little chuckle that all of those crazy diagrams that he made were actually made in AutoCAD. Um, Aaron's tool of choice is uh, SketchUp. And uh, that one on the right is SketchUp and the video that we all just saw was also SketchUp. Um, but unlike seemingly everyone else who uses SketchUp, it doesn't look like a coloring book, does it? 
uh, rather they're, they're clear and defined. But it's not drawing for drawing's sake, it's always getting at something else. And I think that something else has become building. Um, you can see the way he draws and the way he builds. You can see him drawing with material. Uh, like the drawings, you can see the simplicity of tools, materials, and, uh, and the process in his building. Um, he's not reinventing the materials, he's reinventing how to use them. He's sublimating. Uh, just like he uses standard graphic conventions in his drawings, he uses off-the-shelf standard materials uh, from Home Depot. The, the painted pink metal lines that he uses for framing and uh, those lights are electrical conduit, standard electrical conduit. Uh, he does things and uh, he makes drawings and prints them on drywall, etc. Uh, but he's not, he's not building for building's sake, but he's always getting at something else, again. Um, and I think that something else is a constant critique of how we use cities, a constant critique of culture, a constant crit critique of technology, a constant critique of architecture, and a constant question of why. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Jones. Thank you, that was very nice. Can everybody hear me? I'm a little soft-spoken, even when amplified. Um, the, vi the video that was playing when everybody was coming in, that's, uh, that's some student work. If those students are here, that would be great. I see Charlie, Isla, Brianne, maybe. Oh, there's Brianne. And John, I don't know if John's here. He's probably frustrated somewhere. Um, those, are, those, are students, those are students of Wes and mine from Critical Practice Studio that continue to uh, carry their work forward. And they produced that, that, uh, that short video, about 20 minutes long, and it was presented at the Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York City which, if you're not familiar, is a, is a really leading kind of um, venue for experimental stuff. So it was a really big win uh, for me, for them. And uh, we, we cut it about 15 minutes short. So when I'm done, uh, I'll just play it again, since we've got good audio and that kind of thing. Cool? Um, thank you, Deirdre and Charlie and Amy in distance. This is funny, because I teach a lot of writing classes, and I ask students, OK, tell me what it is that we do. Like, wh what are we doing here? And he goes, well, I'm a designer and I design designs. I'm a good designer designs good designs, real good. That's meant to be a joke, okay. <clears throat> so I, uh, I consider myself an architect, an illustrator, and a fabricator. I'm also a faculty member here and I have been for about five years. So um, thanks for coming tonight. And uh, thanks for coming tonight and I also wanna thank you for all the work that we've done together. My dad is an artist, this is one of his paintings in the middle. Um, he's a painter, and he's also a college professor. So in a way, I've been around this murky realm of practice and academia all of my life. In fact, it is in this realm where I feel most professionally comfortable. If I was to ask my dad what his work is about, he would say, my work is about the work. And what that means is that for him, the production of painting is an exercise which allows his worldview to evolve over time. The conception of his work is not in pursuit of capital or political gain. In fact, to make work which seeks to make money would undermine the exercise fundamentally. Uh, does this practice provide a life filled with Ferraris? Not really. Um, but my dad is deeply satisfied with his work and intellectually, he has no pretense. <laughs> um, is everyone over 18? Okay, so uh, think of a scenario where a creative professional receives a commission. They're asked to produce a diagram. The response is a series of shapes and colors which reconcile theoretical context with a specific situation. The work is a red circle and a yellow triangle. The client says, that's great, that's really great. The thing is, I just bought blue carpet. Change it to blue and I'll buy it. I'll pay you twice as much. My pedagogical position is not to stay red or go blue, so to speak, but rather to empower individuals to develop and issue ideas and ultimately find professional satisfaction from a variety of sources. Then, uh, winning isn't based solely on saying yes. So 
In fact, I believe that um, the lack of quality in our vi environment stems from not saying no often enough. Okay. Can someone tell me what this is? I'm gonna pretend I heard someone say an auditorium, even though Charlie got it right. No, uh, I'm here to tell you that we are in an auditorium right now together. In fact, this is no more an auditorium than this. And that's pretty much what my work is about, the productive and slippery link between space and its representation. Architects work towards building, though rarely work on buildings. We tend to make drawings, models, mock-ups, which translate into buildings. I know some of you are reading uh, Robin Evans' A Translation from Drawing to Building, which frames what I'm talking about uh, famously. So, this translation means that our work tends to issue through abstracted processes, a, a drawing, for example. The important thing to note, I believe, is that these abstracted tools and media we deploy in order to develop our architectural ideas influence the ideas themselves, and therefore they matter a great deal. My practice asks that we become aware of the loaded nature in our work uh, and then find ways to critically measure its effect. So when we make something, the tools and media and intent form something of an experiment. Le Corbusier calls it a framing of inquiry. The idea becomes transformed and the inquiry reframed through iterations in scale, media, etc. So in that regard, I consider my work um, experimental, even when it's mundane. And experimental work for me doesn't really ever solve anything but rather allows me to ask questions, evolve a worldview, and engage the worldview of others. Bonus points, what movie is this from? None of the old, nice one. Where did it just play recently? Redford Theater was very good. Uh, live organ accompaniment. Okay, um, so if you can imagine drawing a red circle on a piece of paper, why do you need to draw it? The answer is, physically, you cannot completely imagine the circle drawing. Physical processes have a neat way of engaging physics. And so every time, the circle is different or transformed through feedback with physics. Digitally, or through a computer, you can more closely imagine a circle. Physics have a harder time sneaking in. And so computers and discrete digital processes tends to be less of an experiment uh, and more of an affirmation which is why you have to get it out of the computer. Abstraction is a type of fiction, a suspension of reality for strategic means. I admire this type of illustration because the architecture is uh, the means to a social comment, even a silly one. The architecture here scaffolds a little moment in time and an oversized baby. <laughs> so does this, frankly. Charlie's intro is apt. This is the opening scene from what? Yeah, nailed it. It's the default scene. Not that this is bad or that any tool is inherently good or bad, uh, though to leave these defaults unquestioned is to remove the opportunity to more intimately explore your idea. The fiction is set before you orchestrate it. And from us, us in, the, in the sort of studio realm, a lot of the work that we do is actually trying to unpack or undo the defaults that are already loaded within the work without being critically engaged. Uh, this is my new superhero. This is local il illustrator Charles Schrittet, um, who used futuristic architectural scenarios in order to advertise Motorola televisions. These images came to be known as the Motorola houses. You can check out the image on the left with the boy swimming next to the house somehow. It's underwater or something, but next to it is a 1960s television set. I would say this is well-crafted, not because it's clean, but because the image orchestrates ideas, tools, and media relative to an audience. Somehow the optimization of these elements comes to form my understanding of craft, maybe along our Professor Nelson's lines of minimum means and maximum effect. No comment. Okay. 
the computer can be a powerful agent of fiction because it can perpetuate scenarios with less physical feedback. This is the winning entry from a recent design build competition in Flint, Michigan. This is real uh, in the sense that we can see it and understand the physical phenomena it represents. But does this also represent the understanding required to build this thing or the willingness to go uh, to negotiate with physics? That's what got built. <laughs> there is some distance between the two. <laughs> Whose fault is this? You know, bad design often starts with the belief that you're a good designer, and the computer tends to reaffirm what you already know. That's the issue. The feedback is an affirmation rather than quantitative. Imagine if the image on the right came first even at a smaller scale or a strategic portion, a mock-up. The designer could then decide if their ambition was the stretched skin thing, or they were willing to have the idea transformed through physical feedback and maybe orchestrate wrinkles as an opportunity, an evolution. This is the type of project we want cities to offer, by the way. Opportunities for experimental architecture to interface with the public and also opportunities for young architects to gain critical experience building. Dream impossible. Whose fault is this? Check out the jurors. You think they would know better. So who do you think was blamed? The architect. Though they didn't help themselves. The image on the left is a photoshopped correction of the actual project, which was sent out as a press release. They actually corrected the physical manifestation back towards the digital one. And its only goal was to exist on a design block. But I have to tell you that, that the digital realm has physical implications. And the residents of Flint posted the actual photos in the comments section, and it turned into a scandal. And it sunk, it sunk the, the, um, the competition. It sunk this fake uh, architecture firm. And guess who got blamed? OK. So what's this? Charlie said it. An image of an auditorium. What happens when the surface becomes the interface for types of work, sometimes known by their building types? Here's a few examples of, of uh, work and interface that I do with different people. Does this turn our auditorium into an office or a studio? OK. That's that portion of the talk. Next, rapid fire one-liner words of wisdom to take or leave. These are some mantra uh, which help me. Ideas need sites, uh, and then as a result of situating them, they produce scenarios. Once ideas touch the earth, there are implications. I bend that around to think in a lot of different ways, whether that means I'm putting drawings on paper or getting it out of a computer or placing it on the earth and understanding there's solar orientation or any number of things. But situating something results in implications for me. Discipline over default. I think of art, design, and architecture as disciplines, not prescribed things. Uh, we don't have to look alike or agree, or look like yesterday's version. In fact, I think we have a responsibility to evolve and define our discipline. Theme over theory. That one's longer discussion. I will, show, I will talk to you about that in the gallery. Uh, topic over type is how I frame my graduate studios. We aren't trying to revision the office building or mixed use, whatever. In a way, starting with type and program is already, uh, starting with a type or a program is already at a disadvantage, where you have to one-up your predecessor. I prefer to start with issues. This means I'm more comfortable in the realm of prototype than typology, which uh, is a kind of typology which I can understand as studio-based research.
I'm sure we've all used these in our descriptions of things. And I want you to be careful because they're also, um, in my opinion, terms of exclusion. These terms have a counterpart. To call something native is to also understand that there is a not native. My least favorite is the overuse of the prefix re, R-E, which means to do again or look back. At what point in time do we return to when we revision Detroit? I think this misunderstands a nostalgia for a precedent, which can be very, very dangerous. Cities don't need to be revitalized. They need to be perpetually vitalized, and I think there's a distinct difference there. For that matter, here are some other terms which need perpetual, perpetual definition, or uh, what I said before, an ongoing framing of inquiry. Topics over types help the deliverables become non-deterministic. That sounds awfully academic. Do you guys know what that means? Non-deterministic? What's the opposite of non-deterministic? Deterministic. What fun is it to make something that you already know what it's gonna be? Non-deterministic allows your ideas to transform as they begin to engage the world. Ideally, the deliverables allow others, clients even, to collaborate with the process. So in that regard, the ideas become transformed and what you arrive at is different from where you start. Raise the stakes. This, this is a restaurant I wish all creative professionals dined at. <laughs> because as soon as you take your work seriously, so will someone else. Actually, I tried to like voice memo that and this is how my phone told me the note was supposed to look, which was smarter, so. True story. Last, this is something I've developed in collaboration with lots of colleagues, and it's something I really, truly believe. Um, and it just involves inv uh, investing in your creative practice. Increased stability equals an increased field for creativity. Design is not necessarily completely manifest from chaos, I promise. Okay. Project mix. So um, a, lot of my, a lot of my work is, uh, installed as pinup in our, what we call the brick gallery. And uh, there's project descriptions and diagrams and all that stuff, so you can engage it as, as deeply as you want. And I thought to kind of um, break that routine, I reached out to a few colleagues. I asked them, hey, um, you know, is maybe, there's a, maybe there's a question that you would ask of me and my work or whatever, and I could frame like my projects around that as a little micro topic. Hi, Aaron. This is Marshall Brown. Hi, Marshall. Can you talk about pleasure and or fun as an architectural or urban strategy in your work? Intimidating voice, that Marshall. Um, uh, and so I'm, just, I'm not going to wax on about this too long. Uh, to play is to explore and to construct something. Playfulness, for me, results in engagement and interactivity in a really heightened field. This project is called YouTube Theater. Uh, where individuals are able to script the experience through iPhone docking and digital media uh, interaction. It's framed around uh, participatory programs, and as uh, Charlie alluded to, it's actually made from um, all materials purchased from Home Depot. This project is produced through the post-process of readily available materials and products, um, where chain link fence pipes are selected for their ability to connect through a pinched or uh, assuaged end, and therefore forms a structural system. Can you guys see the swage? I was um, really interested in swages for a long time. Uh, but but these, these, pieces, uh, these pieces are off the shelf, and they come with a kind of a minimum amount of pre-engineering loaded into them. Um, so with uh, a small amount of thought, they could become uh, a connected or interconnected system because the pinched end fixed, fits into the not pinched end. Okay, um, so I bought the piece of equipment on the left, pipe bender, um, 300 bucks. Uh, and so through some mock-ups and some drawing types, I was able to develop a system through abstract means in an, in an intimate process. With the pipe in the pipe bender and all aspects were constant, a pump of that equipment, which is now in the top right corner, uh, produced a repeatable effect. The computer organized these into bend angles, and I merely had to know the number of pumps to produce certain parts. 
This produced a new drawing type or prototype, which I call pump diagram. What is it that's vital about movement? That's Haynes. That's Haynes. Shout out to Haynes. Okay. Um, what is it of vital about movement? I don't know, but Haynes saw one piece of mine that had hinges on it. He thinks that like everything I do is movable. Um, but I was gonna, uh, I was going to, um, you know, commit to the process I put forward. And this is the way I respond then. Architecture is sort of relentlessly thought of as a static and permanent thing, must stay put, must stay here forever. Um, and sometimes that stasis can be oppressive or that mentality can be oppressive. And uh, what, what I believe truly is that I think things are moving and evolving all the time. And in that regard, no architecture is necessarily temporary or permanent, but just held within a certain notion of time. Over the past uh, few years, I've been working with performance and visual artists, complex movements uh, in their theater production. This work tries to reimagine the relationship between performer and audience through live performance, pre-recorded content, and live stream slash rendered content. It's very technical. The project uh, has to travel and is meant to install within underrepresented communities, collaborate with these communities, and have their participation impact the project narrative uh, in real time. The, the different scales here represent different distances and logistics. And so the one on the left kind of travels to um, museums that kind of scale and that scale of time. The, the structure in the middle travels to uh, arts organizations, um, community organizations, that sort of thing. And then the, the one on the far right is meant to travel through the mail and not come back. It's meant to be disposable. So I'll just let you soak in this diagram. Maybe produced with SketchUp, I'm not gonna tell you. But it deals with aspects of uh, uh, telematic aspects, live audience, streamed audience, etc. This is the big theater, and the big theater holds about 25 to 30 people. This is the master plan, so to speak, where urban discourse, how dare you, Martin, where urban discourse should occur and matters most uh, is often the most difficult in terms of logistics. These little theaters try to think about that and utilize telematics as an infrastructural uh, co-conspirator. So, like, how do we, like, do we, do our, does our architecture, do our ideas not engage with um, people in Pyongyang? I have no idea. But it was interesting to take that on and think about how architecture might be able to do that through sort of subversive means. That's where the little guy comes in. That one, that one probably is from SketchUp, whatever. Let's see if I can pause that. Ah, sorry. Paused. Okay. Note the model, um, this is Wes in there. Note the model on Wes's screen is mapped around the theater. Wes is in that circle. So this is what I was kind of talking about in terms of digital and physical um, thresholds, re-engaging the audience in different modes. And that screen, for example, could exist anywhere. Now it just happens to be conveniently in the middle. Uh, and on the right, uh, funny enough, we were asked to send a small version to the Venice Biennale this year, or this 2014. And so we flat packed it in a big pizza box and had fun making the graphics. I guess these are diagrams I don't get to show too often, but this is just one that refers to different parts. Hey, Aaron. So I've noticed that your work can be really serious and really funny simultaneously. I want to know how you use jokes critically and why they're so important to your work. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, because humor is subversive, and as a result, it can cut across political boundaries and engage a more diverse audience. Think of, uh, think for example, like if you put a floor plan on a wall, 
and how limiting and narrow that could be for an architectural conversation. This project is called Architectural Digest. The project framed a conversation about urban issues, particularly blight, from the perspective of a young child. In this work, the child imagined monsters were eating buildings in her city as a mechanism for reconciling with her environment. The theme allowed us to curate Chris's work uh, simply because it looked like a digested building chunk to me. Shout out to Chris. Uh, and here's the computer and how I used it to organize an inflatable tube into an unfolded construction diagram. If you want to know more technical specifics, I'll show you in the gallery. But the long and the short is that this is a specific product called Bag on a Roll, and the entire inflatable structure was made from a continuous loop and bungee cords and a, a compressor. Here's a, here's a big model of the thing and a floor plan, actually. In this case, the floor plan wasn't really trying to communicate to contractors, but it allowed a, um, a series of us to collaborate and think about um, how we repurposed the gallery space, like colors. Uh, and it also corresponded with a short, um, excuse me, with a short story. Here's a, uh, and the short story was, uh, had illustrations. Um, the drawing on the right is by me and the drawing on the left is uh, by me and uh, Wes. So uh, I wrote this story, here's, a, here's a, an intro and here's a description and a piece of the story. So TV, a young girl from Detroit begins to generate urban fantasies which bridge her graphic environment with an incomprehensible commentary. She places this daydream within her favorite place, the Guardian Building located within present-day Detroit. TV ponders the future of this special place while trying to reconcile uh, with the forces which affect her environment. That's the description. Um, and we just wrote it in, or I just wrote it in short little one line. Sometimes TV imagined that monsters were eating the buildings in her city. As she walked, TV would think to herself, oh, here they, here they just took a nibble. Other times saying they really pigged out. Good bones she had once heard a neighbor say, and just a skeleton another time. TV really couldn't understand why some buildings were gobbled up while others seemed to be left alone. For us, this was um, you know, an interdisciplinary super collaboration, which allowed us to talk about things that we hear about every day, blight, for example, in a new way, and ultimately engage an, an alternative audience, um, aside from maybe those that talk about blight every day on the news or something. Um, but ultimately to be creative and put something back out. Good evening, Aaron. At what scale does your mind design and at what scale does the work become exhibited? Uh, good one, Joel. That's Joel, former student uh, here. I would say that um, my mind designs at uh, full scale, tactical scale. Um, and as a result, drawings and models and mock-ups become objects in their own right, in a way. I'm not uh, in any way really in uh, pursuit of objectifying them, um, though that is one realm where I, I guess I overlap with a fine art market. Here's some, here's some kind of new work that's been ongoing since about January. Um, so I don't have as smooth a spiel because I'm in the midst. But this, this work looks at digital and physical thresholds, surface quality, and what I'm referring to as sci-fi faux finish. Ultimately, we're thinking about what a wood grain would look like for trees that either never existed or trees that no longer exist. The image on the right is called a wood grainer tool, and it's sold by Martha Stewart. I guess this is, out of, uh, this is at Home Depot too, whatever. But um, uh, but it's it's how you turn your it's like how you add value to cheap pieces of wood, I guess. I don't know, or something, um, something like that. And so this has just been some kind of really interesting way to think about adding value to things 
uh, or ironically messing with value or something. So in the, in the Brick Gallery, the, this actually started a while back. And if you think back to that medium pod, it was, it was made out of wood, kind of red. Um, that's actually made out of uh, maple plywood. And the nature of the narrative that it was holding allowed me to think about kind of like genetically modified wood or something. It was kind of peculiar. But there's a, there's a panel in the staircase with a, with a faux finish made from like the wrong color of paint, um, which is much more fun than trying to make real looking wood. It's kind of more fun to make, um, you know, ridiculous wood or whatever. So that's where a lot of this stuff started. Um, and, and this project began to think about like well, what happens if that, like how can we scale that up or make that a really ridiculous scale? Or what is the wood grain, it was like in this, um, the redwood forest recently, uh, which is so overwhelmingly kind of science fiction vibe. Um, so uh, it inspired a, a new tool, which I guess kind of talk, uh, speaks to this idea about, about prototyping. So, I mean, these prints are everywhere. I made a million of them. But, um, but they're actually trying to not necessarily become art prints per se, but really become a different kind of weird architectural material that I could clad things with. So, old, grow, old growth fo working title, old growth faux finish, sci-fi faux finish. Um, but to make this, I had to make a tool, and that's what that thing is on the right. It's, it's that thing, supersized. Speaking of, uh, this work issues out again uh, in an exhibition at Marygrove College. And if you guys haven't been there, it's worth a visit in its own right. But we're going to have a show, a collaboration of uh, Mark Deneen, Wes Taylor, and myself next Friday. Please come check it out. There's more. Hey, Aaron. Hey, uh, what piece of design ever really touched you out? I don't know, Stefan. I would say. Um, my colleagues and collaborators first. I co-run a design studio on the east side where we make experimental work and we try to support each other. Thinking that the most creative thing that we could do is help create other creative practices. We're in our fifth year. My student and faculty colleagues. Shout out to Philip, I don't think he's here. This is the work actually from Critical Practice Studio summer before last uh, that turned into the video cartoon um, that you were watching as you came in. My ongoing work with Wes, my design buddy. Um, did that jiggle yet? There it is. <laughs> uh, Big Models LA is working title. We're opening a gallery in Los Angeles um, soon. Uh, and we intend to put on a few shows a year and uh, put out an art magazine. Stay tuned. receive all of this info. Jerji, Jerji is really instrumental uh, with, with organizing, printing, cropping, and pinning up the work in the gallery. So I know he's not here, but if you Google Jerji, this image comes up, <laughs> which is great. So special thanks to Jerji. While we were installing it, I didn't know there was a dance club. Shout out to the dance club. That's really great. Um, uh, I guess this would be Saturday after next. Uh, mine and Aaron Professor Blandowski's uh, studio, we're gonna go take a quick trip to view the important work at the Chicago Architecture Biennial, um, a day trip. And so we invite anybody who wants to caravan and with us to come. Amy, who's uh, doing her DCDT thing, has a ribbon cutting. And then uh, we have some good folks coming next week. Thank you. I'll try to go back to a good one. I can, I can, if there's some questions, I'm happy to, you know, try to answer them. And if, if not, um, I can, or if, if not, we can go look at work and I can talk about stuff there. And I can also just play the other end of that video or some combination.
So like if you go to Japan, you like get, can't like stop getting questions. That's a Megan Martin joke, whatever. Hello, Jana in the back. Nice to see you. I'll change this. This one, raise the stakes. Uh, I mostly, I'm, uh, so to be specific, I'm, I, I teach mostly in the graduate level and then occasionally in um, VSCOM classes in the undergraduate level. Uh, so I know that, that that's, a, that's a privilege and we can talk about type in a different way as students have kind of moved through technical skills and their awareness to different types of buildings and that kind of thing. But in general, I try to tell my students that to strive to, to make work which is a B plus instead of a B and to like worry about that distinction doesn't matter actually at all. Um, and for them to try and like do work which only receives affirmation from me as being like a good job or a bad job really produces kind of like, sorry if it's offensive, really produces kind of beat dog type designers where you look to be pet or you look to be smacked. And that, that doesn't get anybody anywhere. So in general, as a kind of component of design method, I guess, um, I just really try and push students to find ways to where they can raise the stakes for themselves, find feedback from a broad variety of sources, and then not make or break projects whether or not somebody one time said it's good or bad. Um, and you become a lot more satisfied as a kind of creative person that way, I think. And, I, and truly, ideally, um, your individualism really does come through and becomes developed that way. Is that it? Any more? I'm gonna call on people. Dustin Altschul, what are you thinking? I, I saw your face. more to even Jana's question, the, like being a creative professional, art, design, architecture, all that stuff, um, it's really for me a way to move through the world and, uh, and it's a pleasure. And so um, it's finding, finding ways from a variety of sources to become creatively satisfied is amazing. And having your work engage other people in a way and evolve a conversation is thrilling, I think. And um, the, to, to narrow that down to like a specific line of output, if you guys can see like, if you go see the, ga the gallery show, um, you know, to narrow that down to a specific line of output over and over again is really difficult for me because everything becomes something of a, of a strategy, I guess, um, to get to some kind of conversation to engage with other people. So, and that way it's like, all right, it never ends, it's fun. And that's probably why all of my uh, trusted friends here in pre-recorded questions um, ask things like, why, what's up with all the fun stuff or what's up with all the jokes or whatever. Anything else? I guess, I guess we can say there's some questions loaded into the thing too, so whatever. All right, 
Thanks for coming. Oh, hello. I don't know who you are. Stop researching. Like, when do you feel like you've extracted enough information to fuel theory? Where, what, where are you at in your education? Uh, I'm in an integrated science five right now. Okay. I'm trying to interpret that coding language. Okay. <laughs> when do I stop researching and do what? What's to, that? I guess, to like, to get to your conclusions that you've made and to create these projects that are so unprecedented. How do you feel like you have the information and the thought process to keep going through it? Like, how do you stop thinking and start producing? Oh, great. That's the easier way of thinking about it. You don't. <laughs> like, like, time to turn brain off, time to make things. No. It's like a, it's a mess. Like, it's, it's, uh, and it should be. You know, so uh, different people say it in different ways. Uh, Professor Stevens would call it research through making. Uh, Professor Eugene probably in a similar line. Uh, I, would, I would just say that it's all the same thing. Like, if you're really asking the things that you're doing in your studio to give you feedback in one way or another, then it's always an experiment. Your work is always experimental, and you're always kind of striving to get to some kind of end. You know, research doesn't necessarily begin with like, we're doing a church, let's go get five books on churches, and let's make a different church. Here's a zany church shape. Now it's time to make that church shape. Doesn't work, doesn't really work that way. Um, so, and the, maybe the most important piece to that is to try and find different ways to issue the work, um, both to myself and colleagues, um, but also to an audience, um, a different, different types of audience. And that might mean that it's in a gallery show filled with colleagues and students and things like that, uh, a formal gallery show somewhere, or you might just consider that it's um, being used as a piece of architecture, and then the feedback from its occupation is a way to learn too. So it doesn't, I don't know, for me it doesn't really like stop. Maybe that's a good, that's a good time to stop. Thank you guys. We're gonna play the video if you wanna stay.